you're going to have to remember all the way back to last week. Last week, where did we leave the disciples? Last week, since we need a review, last week where we left the disciples, we had Doubting Thomas, we had them locked in a room because they were afraid. The apostles were afraid that the Jews who had crucified Jesus were going to come and hunt them down and butcher them just like they did to Jesus. And so these apostles were terrified. We're told they were afraid and they hid. So when we read our reading this morning from the book of Acts chapter 2, we're going to notice a slight shift in the apostles' attitude. It stands out real clearly. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Men of Judea and all you residents of Jerusalem, understand this and listen closely. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus who you preach. Big shift happened in the attitude of those disciples. They went from hiding in a room with locked doors, afraid of what mere mortals might do to them, to going out in the city streets, to going out in the temple and pointing at these people and saying, you guys, you guys, you right there, yeah, you, you murdered Jesus Christ. You killed King David's greater son. You killed the anointed. start to see as the disciples are faithfully speaking that word of God, we start to see the power that God's word has. Because remember back to Good Friday, there was a mob shouting, crucify, crucify, as we heard in our gospel lesson, those disciples going on the road to, to the town of Emmaus, everybody in Jerusalem knew what had happened. That was the size of the uproar and the chaos and the murderous screams as Peter said, you guys chose an actual murderer and said, kill this guy who makes food for the hungry. Kill this guy who heals the sick. Kill this guy who raises the dead. What did God's powerful word do? Now when the people heard this, cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, what should we do? The word of God, that law of God works. That law of God worked to convict those Jews, that they were guilty of sin, that they had crucified Jesus Christ. That law of God convicted them and it led them to, con and it convinced them that they needed Every one of us has experienced that power of God's word, specifically, again, we have experienced 
mysterious power of God's law provides. Because we have many examples in the Bible of God's law actually working. Some of the two most famous examples would be that of Saul. He was that murderous guy who wanted to kill all the Christians. And then on the road, what did Jesus say? Why are you persecuting me? And Saul all of a sudden became Paul the great evangelist. God's law is work. Remember anything about Jonah? Don't shake your head. What do you know? All right, that's pretty good. I, in the first service, it was this guy got eaten by the giant fish, right? Yeah, but you told us why. He was running away because God had told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to go to your people's enemies who are banging on your door, going to slaughter you guys in a few years. I want you to go, Jonah. And I want you to preach my law to those people. And that message that Jonah said was, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And what happened? That law of God worked on the king of Nineveh down to the lowliest peasant. And in turn, God did not bring them from the dead. That law convicted and That's what God's law does to us. Sometimes God's law requires you. Sometimes God's law just works through a punch. It's after we have a moment to reflect on something that we said, we come to the realization as our conscience starts to bother. As we get more time to reflect, to remember, my eyes went from I was lost. The conscience work by us allows us to reflect on something much we have. Sometimes God's law doesn't work so quietly like through your conscience. Sometimes God's law works through a parent or a sibling or even a child as they are. I don't think that's what God wants you to do. How God wants you. Then what happens when that law of God is shared with us? Do we respond like those Jews in our reading? They were cut to the heart or off, and what happens? We resist that working of God's law. We try and fight it. It's not my fault. We make excuses. Everyone else is doing it. I was pressured into it. Don't resist that law of God as it works on your heart. Don't make excuses because...
Now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, They needed rescue. Giving to someone to take away that shame and guilt that they were feeling. What did Peter send to them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift for the promises for you and for your children and all. For, for all who are far away, as many as the Lord God will call. He testified solemnly for with many other words and was appealing to them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people. Once that law of God had convicted, once that law of God had led them to realize, I need rescue, what did Peter say? He didn't look at them and say, well, you made your beds, now you got a lion. He didn't say, now throw all this money at us, and hopefully that'll take away your sins, or go and lead a good and godly righteous life. No. What the apostle Peter did was he directed them to the one that they had crucified. He directed them, if you want to be saved, here it is, trust in, believe in Jesus Christ, the one you killed. Because it is only in him that you will have forgiveness. It is only in him that your sins will be full. Trying to fight it because it just fails. Don't turn your eyes to something you can do. Don't sit here and say, I will make a mess. Do as the Lord directed the Apostle Peter to speak to those people. Trust in the work that Jesus Christ has done for you. Treasure what he has done for you there on Good Friday as he endured the agony. Trust in what he did as he suffered the torments of hell. Trust in what he did as he breathed his last and gave up his life. Why? For salvation. <coughs> Trust that because Jesus led him and died, your sin. If you're able to recall and reflect on those words that you said, on those statements that you made, on the anger and hostility that poured forth out of your heart, through your mouth. Trust that your Savior Jesus, his death was powerful and effective enough to even remove the sting of your sin. Freedom from the wrath of God is yours because your Savior Jesus went in your place and has set you. Freedom from fear of death is yours because your Savior, Jesus Christ, over and over again proved that he had conquered death by his resurrection from the dead. That tomb stands empty. Your life stands secure because your loving Savior said, here it is, my victory is yours. A little bit later today, we get to have a wonderful private baptism, and as our Savior Jesus teaches us here, that simple act of water in the Word will assure the family and that child who will be baptized son, that he is forgiven, that he is a child of God and an heir. God gives that forgiveness. Yeah. little neat thing in those verses, that last verse, the 3,000 were added to their number. Do you know why that happened? It's not because Peter was able to put on a great show. It's because all Peter did was share the powerful and effective of God. 
by the will and love of God that church is. And that's what we get to do here. We don't put on a good show. We're not here for entertainment purposes. We're not here because, forgive me for saying it like this, I'm easy on the eyes. We are here simply because the power of God's word leads us to tread. Okay, maybe it's kind of true. <laughs> but we are here because of the powerful word of God in which we hear forgiveness of sins is not worked for, it is not earned, but it is a wonderful gift that your Savior Jesus gave. Here it is yours, and I want you. I want you to be in heaven, and I have done all the work and everything that is necessary to make you join me forever. That's why we are here, because God has convinced you. They continue to hold firmly to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Awe came over every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done for the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They were selling their possessions and property and were distributing the proceeds according to what anyone needed. Day after day, with one mind, they were devoted to meeting in the temple area and to break bread and Excuse me, they shared their food with glad and sincere hearts as they continued praising God and being in favor of the Lord by all the people. Day after day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Verses. God is not advocating for a type of government where everybody just shares everything and everything is equal. What God is doing in these verses is is highlighting the oneness, the unity that God's people have together. They would see someone in need and they would help. They would, if they had access, they would share with others so that they would not be lacking. They were moved because they had one singular goal in mind. Sharing that message of Jesus Christ. That's what united them. And in love, or as we heard in that first reading, or second reading, because of what Jesus did for them, and they were going to live for him and show their faith by their actions. One quick story. I had the privilege yesterday to go to Luther Preps, this thing called uh, uh, a gala. At that gala, what they did was they raised money for this project that Luther Prep is trying to do. And why were the people there, everyone, as they were writing checks and giving money, why were they there? Was it to prop Luther Prep up more than Lakeside? Or more than Shorewood? Or more than Onalaska? Why were the people there? I didn't know barely anybody. It was really awkward. Why were they there? Because they are united in one singular mission of helping to grow God's kingdom through the encouragement of pastors and teachers. And that's one of the places where it happens. They united their dollars to help accomplish this goal of bringing the message of Jesus clearer and better around the world. Absolutely fantastic. They were united. Not all of them were from Wisconsin. Not all of them are called workers. I don't know what some of them do, but they were there because there is a need. There are 196 There are over 200 classrooms that do not have teachers because there's just not enough to go around. And so what happened last night, what these verses talk about in the book of Acts, people coming together to help support the mission of God's people, not 
a school the mission of all of us. Farmer, fireman, higher simply share. What we do here at St. Paul work together, find our resources together so we can better share. Follow. Oh.